Welcome to the Profitable Farmer Podcast, where it's all about increasing the profitability of your farm by working smarter, not harder. G'day and welcome once again to Profitable Farmer. Been um, really fortunate over the last few months to interview and explore um, COVID-19 and its impact on the finance sector, the property sector, more recently with Tom Bull, the meat sheep sector. Um, I'm delighted today to ask Cameron England to join us. Cameron's from Lindor Park in South East South Australia, and I'll ask him to introduce himself shortly. But this conversation allows us to explore perhaps what we've seen um, in relation to the impact of COVID-19 on the global wool market. Um, Cameron and Katie England run Lindor Park, which is a large wool production enterprise. Um, they are at the um, head of their game. They're incredible people, incredibly sec- successful farming um, family. I think, Cameron, we're a fifth generation family business for you. So I'm looking forward to firstly exploring, I guess, what we've seen recently in um, the wool market. But more broadly, I'm keen to explore how your business has progressed with Farm Owners Academy in the last few years, but then more broadly um, to hear your story and to hear where you're at and where you're off to. So Cameron, thank you for joining us. Yeah, no worries. Happy to be here. It's uh, nice to, uh, you know, have a, have a really good chat with you. Yeah, it's nice to connect, mate. And it is. thank you for sending my four kids a Lindell <laughs> in the mail the other day. We all wear it over here in Cootamundra with real pride. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, no worries. Hopefully one day we'll be able to... Uh, tap in and you'll be able to find us a few clients over there. Perfect. I look forward to that. (laughs) Cameron is married to Katie. They've got a 16 month old girl, Harriet. And um, as I say, they run a very successful wool production enterprise in Southeast South Australia. Just before we go in and really introduce you and your family um, and your business more fully, Cam, I'm really keen for your take on what's happened in the last few months in the wool market. What's you, what you've seen, um, what's behind that in your assessment through wool supply chains? And perhaps then let's explore how you think it might unfold from here. Yep. Um, yeah, well, I'm certainly not going to call myself an expert in that. I mean, I can't tell you, uh, you know, what the market's going to do tomorrow and that, but I can only, you know, make predictions. Uh, obviously, it's it's come back significantly since uh, COVID-19 hit and, and it was actually obviously sliding Prior to that, too, um, a certain amount of that would have been to do with the China-America uh, trade war over the tariffs. So it, we can't blame the pricing today completely on um, COVID-19, but it's certainly had a significant impact. Uh, um, you know, it's obviously going to be impacting, um, you know, the people that are, have been out of work. Uh, so therefore, they're not, you know... Uh, getting their income uh you know so therefore i mean wool is a luxury item so if you if the the money is not there then people aren't going to be buying a luxury item they're going to be you know buying the essentials um you know so therefore if they're not buying it they're they're, they're stock that's you know down the supply chain so you know so they don't need to be producing as much uh so therefore you know they're not they're, they're just buying cheaper wool um, because they don't have to. So so a large portion of the, the price drop is demand driven, a reduction in demand because of COVID. Are there also disruptions within the supply chain? Have processing um, the processes across yeah. the world had to close? What's happened yeah. in the supply chain as far as you're aware? Yeah, well, obviously the uh, China where it, where it first hit uh, is, is that one of the major, or as everyone knows, is the major buyer of Australian wool. And, and their factories and we're, we're out of action for a while. So yeah, that, that you know, and, there, and there's wool already on the way uh, in, in ships that they can't say stop and they've already bought that. And, uh, and, and you know, so there was a period, a, a bit of a lull where they weren't even, uh, you know, turning over their, their stock. So, so that, that then created a bit of a backlog and, and therefore they didn't need to be buying any, any new stock as well. So, there's been any number of impacts from from 
as you as you mentioned the supply chain and then the, the end product as well yeah how do you see it I know you don't you can't you're not a, you don't claim to be an expert by any stretch but how do you see it unfolding from fear here as, as things open up and and what's your personal outlook yeah um well i mean uh, to be honest i don't really see it improving much in the 12 next 12 to 18 months I, i'm i'm always hopeful um but i, I think it's going to take a while for uh as I mentioned, it is a luxury item to buy, you know, your nice Italian suits and, and woolen jumpers that, um, albeit they're fantastic fiber and, and, you know, will outlast a lot of your cheaper products, but people will, will be, um, you know, a bit skeptical about, uh, and, and, you know, nervous about how they spend their money. Um, so I still see it being a while. Um, but in saying that, his, we are still at historically high levels in in the wool market. So, uh, you know, I can't control the wool market, but we're still at a really, really profitable level. Um, one that my parents, who are currently upstairs looking after my daughter, would have loved to have, um, you know, been able to achieve over their career because we're still getting 12, 13, 14 do- greasy, you know, dollars a kilo um, for our product, which is, you know, really, really still quite profitable. Uh, albeit last year we were, you know, 20, 30 percent higher. Um, but I'm, I'm still not going to complain. We do what we do well, and and we'll still run a really, really profitable wool business. It's nice to hear you be that optimistic at this time. And for other wool producers listening, I hope that's encouragement to you as well. That that there's still silver lining and real opportunity and real chance of strong profitability even in and around what's played out in the last month or two. Is that a fair comment, Cam? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I am an optimistic person always. Uh, that's just in my character. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, you, you've only got to look back. I took over my farm from my parents that were just about to finish our six-year succession plan. And in the first year, we were just starting to crack that $2,000 a bale. And, and you know, mum and, as I mentioned, mum and dad, didn't really achieve that very often in throughout their farming career. And, and, and I've been above 3000, you know, really, really quite high on some of our prices. And we're still in that, in that low to mid $2,000 a bale. So you only got to look back six, six, seven, eight years. And we, we weren't even achieving what we are now in a global pandemic. So Cam, would you mind sharing with us, I guess, the Lindell Park story, um, perhaps where you're at now and, and a bit more of the family history as it's played out? Yeah, sure. Um, so where I am now, we, uh, Kate or Katie and myself uh, got married a few years ago, but we, I've now, as I mentioned, in my sixth and final year of the uh, a brilliant succession plan that my parents set up. Uh, so end of June, that's all done. Um, so I've been owner operator for, for that six year period. Now, prior to that, uh, I did any number of years with my, um, my dad, you know, we, to begin with just, just his workmen. And then we went into partnership to learn, you know, a bit more about running a business through his eyes. He's a very, very talented, um, like obviously operational wise, but also very good, um, you know, away from the. The operational side at running a business also so he gave me a bit of a bit of an education in that regard um obviously you don't learn everything from your parents because you you know you know what kids are like they think they know better than their parents but are very very lucky to have had a you know an apprenticeship with him as such because he's you know ran a, ran a fantastic business himself and, and handed one over that i've been able to you know put put a few of my um footprints on can i ask how old your parents are cam yes so dad is 72 and mum will be 70 in january coming yeah they're still so young um it's just really encouraging to hear such a proactive and forward thinking succession plan that's played out as you've just described it um clearly that that started a long time ago. Would you mind just sharing a yep. more about how that unfolded and I guess the leadership that, that your mum and father played in that? Yeah, so it probably it 
probably stems back to when uh, my grandfather actually passed away. It, it, I mean, you'd have to ask my dad this one, but it probably stems back to that uh, in that there wasn't a succession plan really in place then and he, he passed away quite suddenly. Um, so therefore there were complications involved in, you know, divvying up the land between the brothers and, you know, you know, you know what it's like, you know, a bit of a, a bit of a mess. Um, so, and my mum really, really put the pressure on dad to make sure that the similar thing didn't happen. Uh, so it's probably, probably stems back to 15 years ago now that they, um, really, really put in the effort. They went and sourced some, uh, some of the best people in the city that were able to help them with planning out, uh, like a really good lawyer and really good, obviously worked with their accountant and financial advisors and stuff. And they were, um, very fortunate that there was your, um, uh, the government was really doing a lot of work on transition to retirement stuff. So they were able to put a lot of profit, uh, cause they were running a profitable business at the time to, um, you know, transfer a lot of money into uh, off farm superannuation assets to then offset the value of the farm so that my siblings, I got an older brother and sister, um, you know, so they could, when when the time came that year, year one of the actual handover happened, uh, we're able to make it as fair as possible um, for both my siblings. So, I, in, in essentially, I got my inheritance from day one uh by by taking over the land and the and the trading side of the land uh and my brother and sister get everything in their superannuation and other off farm assets um you know when mum and dad hopefully a long way down the track but obviously inevitably they will pass away and mm. yeah so they, they really really spent a lot of time and effort to make sure they got it right thank you for sharing that um were you and your siblings actively involved in that whole process or was it something that your parents did um, more directly with their advisors? Uh, more directly with their advisors. Obviously, we were all kept in the loop. But uh, And, you know, luckily, you know, because I know what can happen in farm succession, um, my brother and sister weren't interested in the farm um, and they weren't really interested in in what they were or weren't going to get. Like. Um, so yeah, obviously very fortunate that mum and dad have put us in the position that they have, but um, there was no no hard feeling to anyone if they thought that they were winning or losing. There was it was um, everyone was winning really because we got a you know we're all all going to get a, you know really good future um, that and and you know they've got their own careers they 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 just want mum and dad to enjoy as much as possible their retirement and. You know, everyone's going to be happy. Mate, it's wonderful to hear. I have um, done a fair bit of farm consulting in my background and it always amazed me that people were putting the patch of dirt ahead of family relationships. And what comes through for me and what you're saying is that the relationships were the priority and that people were perhaps a little bit less attached to the actual outcome. Um, yep. It's just so good to hear such a positive and proactive whole family outcome it's just fantastic yeah and, and plus i mean dad was super excited that the, ne the next generation was going to take it on and and hopefully you know maybe future generations whether that happens or not we don't know but um you know rather than obviously the easy easy way out would have been if i wasn't interested to just up and sell and and divvy it all up three ways that would have been the easy option but this is the you know the more exciting one because what he's built up is now carrying on and and going further and i guess we get to segue now into your leadership of the business and i guess um what what we've enjoyed being part of over the last three years with you cam as you um participate as a real leader and member in farm owners academy um Tell us a bit more about the business. So, as I understand, 15,000 to 16,000 fine wool merinos. Tell yep. us about your country. Tell us about your um, genetics a bit and, and even your team. I'm just keen for you to give our listeners a snapshot of the business, if you could. Yep. Uh, so, currently, we're just over 16,000. We're about 16,200 sheep at the moment. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, we are a fine wool uh, producer around that 
our average would be sort of 17, low 17 micron um, sheep. Uh, so our country is predominantly flat. We've, we've got a, uh, around about 4,500 acres. We work on about 3,800 of good, good quality grazing country. Uh, generally around that 600 millimeter rainfall, uh, predominantly from, uh, we'd like to think early April, but it's generally sort of late April, early May break to the season um, through to uh, October, sometimes on into November in those really, really, really bumper seasons. Um, yeah, so uh, genetics wise, um, I mean, obviously the, the foundation was, <coughs> excuse me, foundation was set up by my father um, and his brother runs a stud locally, uh, a fine wool stud, uh, Blackford Merinos. And so predominantly our, our base is uh, through him, um, you know, and, and created a really, really great foundation for what we are now trying to achieve. Um, personally, my goals have changed a little bit from what my uncle's stud was. So we are now through, obviously, through Farmers Academy and working with um, Greg Johnson and, and Breed Elite, like their Breed Elite software. And uh, we are now running our own uh, mini stud and, and, and choosing genetics from around the country that really focus on, um, on what my long-term goals and, and vision is now for our business. So we sort of had a slightly different um, approach to what my previous stud was. And, and we think we can, um, you know, produce some really, really, really top genetics ourselves, and, and, and enjoy the process while we're doing it. So just with regard to the enterprise combination um, and many mouths to feed, do you have a cropping enterprise? Do you conserve fodder? Um, do you run other enterprises or are you a dedicated wool producer? Yeah, okay. So now currently we are a dedicated uh, or predominantly a wool producer. Um, at the beginning and, and prior to Farm Owners Academy, I was doing a lot of cattle trading, um, some on our country, some on on other people's country, adjusting and uh, and and then also we we still join. Uh, currently, about two thousand of our ewes are joined to a to a White Suffolk ram, uh, just purely to uh, uh, take advantage of the you know the meat side of things, but also lift our stocking rate through that spring period when we get a really really predominantly all of our feed is grown in that you know late August, September, October, you know, that's when we get our summer bank. Uh, so we, you know, have the, have the crossbred lambs dropped and then uh, sell them all off as soon as the season looks like it's about to finish as, as stores and drops that stocking rate back and, 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 and look after the sheep throughout the summer. Uh, we do sometimes cut a bit of hay, uh, but predominantly we're buying in all, uh, all fodder, just utilise our, our country and then buying in, from others but if we have a bumper season we'll often you know cut a bit of hay just to keep it as quality feed and uh, rather than you know letting it deteriorate as, as summer rainfall comes on. Cam how do you adapt given I guess the the drop in wool price do you make adjustments in real time perhaps to, to joining more to a, a first cross um, and, and upping that in this moment, or do you stay true to the, the longer term plan that you have? How do you, how do you adapt um, based on what's playing out at the moment? Yeah, so I mean, I had this conversation the other day, obviously, I know we're gonna talk about it in a little bit about benchmarking and, and the, the bonuses that we've um, seen come out of that. But obviously, yes, we are uh, gonna be keeping a close eye on what the wool market does between now and Christmas. Um, uh, obviously, we, we have a, a fairly large portion of weathers on, on farm at the moment. Um, so if, if the wool market really doesn't look like it's, you know, climbing again, albeit, as I said before, it's still very, very profitable at these levels. But if if we see that, you know, that there might be a, a like that it's not really heading north again, we will probably on sell a few older or sort of, so shrink the weather uh, portion and, and keep an older generation of ewes and, and put them to a to a white Suffolk ram just to um, 
it won't it won't shift our stocking rate side of things uh in that obviously pregnant ewes are a higher stocking rate than than weathers um but it will uh you know just just capture that that meat side of things and it's just a really quite quick shift in our focus that's really quite easy to do um you know obviously as i mentioned before we run the breed elite software so you know we can run run our merino use through and and just draft off another 10 or 20 percent off the bottom of the uh, you know on the index that we we rank our use um and and you know that then tightens the ship on our merino stuff so the you know and then you just put those use over the the terminal size so it's really really quite quick and easy to make that shift um it's just a case of watching what the markets do in the in that next period and and I mean, you'll, you'll never get the markets right but you know you can just make a judgment call so what's your focus or what's your view cam on on focusing on one enterprise as your primary and doing it really well versus what we see often and can work really well equally is diversification in your enterprise combination yeah uh I mean, I think I learned this a few years back. I, we did a bit of a cost production workshop with um, uh, some uh, one of the guys from Holmes Sackett on the, you know, this is this is going back ten or fifteen years, and really worked out that what we enjoy doing and are focused on will actually outdo the other enterprises on farm anyway, and and I've and and bringing it back to obviously my three years within Farm Owners Academy and the benchmarking that that really shows up in the results that we were achieving the wool enterprise which is my core passion uh was was excelling uh over the other other individual enterprises albeit they were still very very good and sometimes might be slightly ahead of the wool but on the the longer term uh the wool is what's what's driving our business and it's what's best suited to our country too and 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 I enjoy doing it. I mean, we were running all these cattle, and I don't even like cattle. So, um, you know, obviously they were providing us a bit of income, but just didn't enjoy it. Uh, whereas, you know, like that picture you've got on the screen, I love love seeing nothing more than that coming on the wool table when when we're shearing. So do what we're passionate about and do it to the best of your ability. Yeah, definitely. Um, and and you know. Obviously, prior to Farm Owners Academy, it was was still my passion, but I wasn't really immersing myself in 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 it completely. And through obviously Greg uh, Greg Johnson and my relationship, we've um you know we've already achieved so much, and and oh, the sky's the limit. To be honest, wonderful. So let's talk about that. You arrived to Farm Owners Academy um, three years ago. What did life look like for you then? And um, what were some of the challenges that were in front of you um, as a business owner? Yeah, uh, it was pretty hectic, to be honest, uh, prior to, um, or through, even through the first 12 months of Farm Owners Academy, uh, I was doing everything. Um, I have a retired school teacher um, who's brilliant. He's a retired PE school teacher who initially you know, came to me uh, I recruited him to do two to three days a week, and and because of you know the way I, the the pathway I was heading down, he was getting closer to four to five days, and he's a uh, he's now close to seventy. So at the time, he would have been a sixty-five year old sort of person, and I was going to burn him out, and he was going to say, oh, "Sorry, I just can't do this anymore." Um, you know, we we were doing way too much, um, and so yeah, so oh, quite early on. Um, it was it was clear through con- discussions with Andrew Roberts and, and Greg that that we needed to employ and employ well and and just thankfully there was a local lad who um, you know was shearing at the time and came and did a bit of work for us during the um, during his off season during the winter through through this sort of period we're in now and um, I was actually because Kate's from England was going to the UK and it was it was actually a bit of a job interview. Um, that he looked after the property for four weeks, just threw him in the deep end while I went to England to have a great time with Kate, and you know had a, he, you know I'd showed him around. He'd done a done a little bit of work for us. He knew he knew the way around, and it's in July it pretty well looks after itself um, to a point. But I came back and he'd had this list of jobs, and I came back and there was 
any number of things that were done on top of what I'd provided for him. So it was like, well, he, he just excelled in that job interview. He's a really, really brilliant young individual. And he thinks of the business as though it's his as well. Um, you know, and we tr really try to involve him in it as much as possible. Like we've taken him to Melbourne to see the wool sold and we go to ram sales to sire evaluations, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, and Kate picked up on it early on. He really started talking about the business as though it was ours and what we need to do and all these things. And, and, and that's brilliant. Like, and, and we will, we'll, you know, we do whatever we can to um, keep a happier and brilliant relationship with him because it, it makes life so much more easier for us and frees me up to spend more time with my daughter. And, and, and obviously we, um, you know, want to travel as much as possible. Obviously in this current environment, we can't, but yeah. So, so that we can get to the UK and Harriet can, you know, meet her cousins and grandparents and all those sort of things. And we wouldn't be able to do that without the right staff back here in Australia. Yeah. Thanks Cam. So three years ago, how, how did you feel in terms of your capacity and your skill set as a business owner? I think a lot of us yeah. drive into farming and to your point, we learn a lot from our father and, and all of that, but, but not necessarily do we sort of obtain and, and have the business skill set that you need to run a really successful and profitable business. What, how did you feel about where you were at in that regard three years ago? Yeah, I, I wasn't anywhere really. I was just winging it, just doing things and knowing that operationally I was running a really good business because historically it, it you know, it had been already and I just was following the model that, you know, my father and I had been running for, for quite a while and, and I'd made a few early tweaks to that but knew that it was still going to be running a profitable business but didn't actually know, you know, how to... Do do your your farm financial uh, work away from the business, and I still don't consider myself even close to an expert in that regard. I've still got a lot of training and learning to do in that regard. But yeah, we we didn't really know what was what areas of the business were doing well, what where we could be uh, making adjustments, and um, obviously, yeah, through that farm owners academy, your benchmarking and your and your farm financial framework work uh we you know have, have start, now started to get a, a base and an understanding of of, of where, where and what our business is doing so cam perhaps i get asked quite often what's farm owner academy all about um and what i'd love to do just in in, in answering that is just for you to share your story of how the journey has played out for you. And then if you're willing, let's explore some of the results that you've achieved for yep. I guess that three year commitment to your development and to the program. Yep. I mean, there's, there's so many fundamentals within the, the farm owners Academy community that, you know, it's really hard to, to, you know, mention them all, but obviously you get your operational, more operational and, and financial stuff through, through Greg's ability uh, and then, then you get your your mindset and coaching and goal setting uh, through through Andrew Roberts. Like that's what we've we've really seen in that in the first two years. And then obviously you've jumped on board and and uh, and really um, you know have a similar uh, skill set to Andrew. Uh, you know, and and we and we get a fresh sort of a, a view from yourself, and and have really enjoyed that. Uh, and then obviously we've been very, very fortunate that we had um, the, mate, the amazing Tracy Seacomb as our, uh, you know, business coach. So you, obviously we get her uh, for the two months in between all the Farm Owners Academy deep dive events and we have a, an accountability call with her and she's the most amazing woman beside my wife I've ever met um, and, and really keeps us on the straight and narrow and focused on, you know, what we're trying to achieve, not only in the business, but in family life, in just all aspects of life. And, and you get that from everyone in, in Farm Owners Academy. They Fundamentally, they, they want us to run really successful businesses, but they also want us to enjoy the, enjoy the journey and, and make sure that, you know, at the end, at the end, when you, you know, your life's nearly over, you can look back and say, yeah, I've done everything that, that I really wanted to do and have no regrets. I think at the end of the day, Cam, that a business is just a vehicle to give us what we want in life. And I know that your 
goals and the strategy that you set is very much focused on helping you have real balance, helping you be a good father and a good community man, and um, helping you have real time traveling and, and living a, a rich and successful life with your family. Um, how, um, how were your goals three years ago and, and your strategic plan compared to now in terms of what you have as your roadmap for the future? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, day one there were no goals. Uh, it was just doing what we've what we've always done. So I sort of call that a bit of a, a just because farmer. Uh, do that just because that's what we've always done. Um, obviously, then quite early on, we you know learnt more about um, you know if you if you set vision and, and 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 this was really Andrew Roberts coaching to begin with was you know all the your mindset and 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 vision goals you know, planning and, and quite early, we obviously, we work through the, the vision traction organizer that Farm Owners Academy do. And, and in that we, we nailed a very, very good early on, um, you know, plan as to what we wanted to achieve in the first year, the third year, or the, sorry, the first year, then the, the next three years and, and, and 10 year goals. Um, now that they've changed, since since then now with now that we're three years down the track and to be honest we smashed the the three year goals in in the first year and and um and we're and we're quite quite close to some of the 10 year goals already within three years and at the time you, you probably thought that they were optimistic goals but um clearly they weren't and um so really really if you believe that you can do something and immerse yourself in it then then you will achieve that. So, yeah. So, I think does that sort of cover your question? I, I got yeah, myself a little. Absolutely. Um, I think what that strategic plan allows is for us as business owners and leaders is to sort of take some control over our future. What would you say to to wool producers or farmers out there that are perhaps just um, still in that mindset of that their results are outside their control because of the vagaries of the industry that we're in? Um, so what would I say to them because of the, sorry, I just got myself a little bit sidetracked. Can you repeat that please? So I feel like there's quite a few farmers who um, are a little reactive and yep. going, look, we can't control our prices. We can't control the weather. Therefore our success and our results are outside of our control. I think, you know, you have such a rigorous set of goals, such clear intention, such a strong vision now for your farm such a robust strategic plan that is based on really strong numbers. Um, what would you say to those people who are still thinking like their future is outside their control? Yeah, well, I'd say, you know, you're, well, obviously, as we talked about earlier, you can't really control the pricing, but you can control the business that you run and, and the genetics and the, you know, the, the way that your operational side of things go and, and an understanding of, of what, what is what is working and what isn't working, um, and if you get the fundamentals right and do what you do well and, and run that that business to the to your highest level and immerse yourself in it, then the pricing will take control of itself anyway. Um, you know, we, we we've set goals throughout our, our benchmarking that we're going to talk about in a minute. That you know, that once we achieve them, even if the wool price does go lower than where we are now, we're still going to be running a really, really profitable business and, 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 and we're gonna we're talking like averaging things out over a ten year period. Like you can't just worry about individual years. Like over over a ten year average, if we do what we do well in the wool game, we we will be right up there with whichever industry um, or whichever commodity people are running, I believe, personally. Perfect. And so the benchmarking component, you're right, is, is one part of Farm Owners Academy. And I guess the financial literacy training that is wrapped around that so that um, our members really do have a deep understanding of the numbers. How important was your first benchmark with Greg and, and how important has a regular focus on benchmarking been for you in driving your business forward? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the first one was really, really important. It's obviously really quite difficult to do in the first place and, and something that we, my father and I had talked about for a long time doing, but just hadn't 
thought, oh, no, that's too hard. That's too hard. Let's just we worry about that at next year or whatever. Once I did it and, and we got the results from Greg from the first one, it, it I guess it was a really nice feeling because because we had a really good benchmark. We got a really good pat on the back and, and realised that, yes, we actually are running a good farming business, uh, albeit that there's still improvement. There's always improvement. Um, so, you know, that, that really, really felt nice and it was nice to know, yeah, that we, we were at the top of our game and in that, you know, top end of, of the wool producers. Um, and, and then now we've talked about, uh, you know, you talked about now that we've done three benchmarks and we're about to do our fourth. Um, you know, we were able to set, set goals to make sure that we improve that, that long-term uh, you know, vision uh, out of each of those benchmarks, we were able to to pull things, and it was and as we talked about, it was clear that that wool, being my passion and and being what I really enjoy, was the clear winner. So we've really shifted to uh, a lot closer to uh, what's well, not a hundred percent, obviously, because we we were mating at the terminal um, like for our store lambs, but we. are the vision, long-term vision, is to go closer to to that 100% wool um, enterprise. Well, obviously, with minor shifts that we again we talked about before within the current climate that we can make quite quickly and easily. But but fundamentally, it's a it's a wool producing business, and yeah. So obviously, you can see our first two benchmarks. We um, had a clean fleece weight per hectare of 29.6 in the in the first year. Uh, and then 31.6 in the next year. And, and so we set ourselves that we want to cut 40 kilos of clean fleece weight um, per hectare of, the, of our 17 type micron uh, wool. And, and how are we going to do that? Um, obviously, we worked on our vision with Greg and genetics. And, and luckily for us, there was a drought in New South Wales and we were able to pick up a lot of a lot of really really quality uh, weathers uh, genetically, um, you know, out of out of that place, out of New South Wales and Victoria, really really quite cheaply, and and lifted our uh, wool enterprise stocking rate really quite quickly. And and this last benchmark, I think off the top of my head, it was thirty seven point six. Uh, so just in the third year, we were we're not actually that far away from reaching that goal, and. Um, Obviously, genetics. We're, um, you know, been as we talked about, we've been selecting um, uh, sires from around the country for our AI program that 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 you know meet our long term goals. And with that, we we prob- we'll probably sacrifice a little bit of of our fibre diameter micron um, range, but really, really targeting higher clean fleece weight, um, you know, breeding values that will uh, not only with selection within our our u flock that we that we've done over over the years uh, or for as long as i can remember um we, we will also test and measure our weathers and, and only run the the more profitable weathers as well and and in, in increasing the genetics through the through the ram breeding program then that's going to have a, a quite a quick impact too so you you only got to go to a few um so our evaluation sites around the, the country that are run and, and see what can change within one generation over, you know, you get a core U flock there and then they throw any number of size over them and you see a, a huge shift in just one generation. So in two, three, four, five years, um, it's going to be an amazing shift for us, we believe. It's an amazing result, just that specific metric on its own, to go from 296 kilograms clean fleece weight per hectare to 37.6 within five years um yeah well that's only three years that's i was just about to say that it's yeah. than five um it's three years and that's just an incredible uplift um yeah. obviously creating significantly more dollars per hectare um which helps me appreciate how you can be so robust going into a situation where we've got lower prices for a time what, a, what an amazing uplift in productive capacity across your farm um are there other ways in which you've achieved that is it primarily focusing on the ram team and um 
the genetics or is there more to it than that? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the Ram team, that hasn't, hasn't had an impact yet because we've only just, this is our first drop that's about to start lambing in a few weeks' time that are, that'll be from ramps that we produced. Uh, so, so that really hasn't had an impact yet. Um, it's more like buying in, buying in weathers that, like we did, um, making a really good educational decision and buying in, uh, you know, some young weathers quite cheaply, uh, some with wool on their back, some without. Um, and and have really really done well out of them. Obviously, their their values in, increased um, from where we bought them as well. So that helps. Um, you know, like it was a, it was a really good decision, mm. uh, and probably dropped off quite a few older uh, generations of ewes that that weren't cutting as much wool and um, and and went back to we tightened like I talked about we tightened our um, our breeding flock and, and really really went through them and and were quite hard on them and and if they were weren't looking like they were you know producing obviously we tested and measured them but um and and that's that's gone to a new level as well but uh, you know we were able to remove sheep that weren't as productive and replace them with these like probably two weathers for the same amount of money almost um probably not quite but uh and and that's that's where fundamentally the 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 increases come from, but there will be a bigger increase once these genetics start to to show through in the next sort of four or five years. So what has to happen in the paddock with pastures, um, and I guess in terms of some of the, the production specifics in order to support that? Uh, yeah, so I mean in the paddocks, um, obviously we've you know, put out a reasonable amount of fertilizer. Um, that's a level that we're, like we, we can actually increase that. And we talked about that in my benchmarking call with, with Greg recently about that. There's, you know, room for improvement in that, that regard. Um, and, and then out, I mean, like you're talking operationally in the, in the paddocks or yeah. Um, we're not, not lots really. Like we, we, it's a pretty simple operation. Like we, um, yeah, yeah. There's times of the year when we're busy, but um, there's a lot of time where um, where we're getting that downtime. And you know, at the moment, you know, I probably don't really need to go to work today, but I will. But I don't, I don't really need to. Um, there's because because I have this amazing workman. We he just gets stuff done, and they don't really need me a lot of the time, which which is great because I can then spend more time, um, obviously, with my family, but also. Um, working on the strategic side of the business. Yeah, I want to talk about that shortly. But just, just before we do, the benchmarking, I mean, when we look at your benchmarks, the, the change over the last three years has been significant. Um, some of the key metrics around return on assets managed, um, your profitability ratios, your cost ratios relative to your income, your financing ratios are all incredibly strong and absolutely put you in the top 10 or 20 percent of um, the industry completely but certainly even further to the top of the wool production niche um, where do you go from here like once you arrive to 40 what would be some of what are some of the strategic goals and even personal goals that you have to move forward to over your next three and five years yeah, I mean, I think I think you can never be complacent. There's always there's always going to be something else that we can be doing better. Um, but it, uh, you know, if we get to the point where where um, you know where we think we're we're right at the top of our game, um, which you know, there's no reason why in four or five years' time that we won't be right at the top of our game. Then then we might look. And this is not drawn into our strategic plan at the moment, but we might look into replicating it. Um, there's no reason why I can't, um, you know, mirror what we're doing here somewhere else. Um, if we if we think that's a, a smart financial decision and, and crunch the numbers on that, obviously, um, then then there's no reason why we can't we can't do that and find the right staff because the staffing is out there to to run that. And it might be in your district, it might be in Queensland, it might be who knows, it might be right next door. Um, you know, 
personally, I prefer it to be locally, but you know, there's, there's no reason why we can't be looking, um, you know, for business expansion if, if, if it's the right decision. Cam, um, what are some of the major changes you've made in the last three years as a result of being part of farm owners? You've touched on team. Um, I'd love for you to expand on exactly how that came about and what that's what's that achieved, what that has achieved for you. But what are some of the other things that you're most proud of um, over that journey that you've had with us? Yeah, I mean, and I think probably the first thing that I would be most proud of is being able to share my story as well. Like, uh, I'm, I don't for a second believe that I'm even close to the top of my game, but if, if someone else out there in the Farm Owners Academy community or or today that's that listens to this podcast can can pick up one or two things that you know that they might be able to learn from us then that that's that's what floats my boat you know i've had a i've had a few phone calls over the journey from um from other members of the the uh community uh, particularly in the last 12 months now that you know the the program's expanded and we've got a a lot more wool producers and and like-minded producers that are you know keen to learn i've had i've had quite a few phone calls which is which is really nice because it it means it tells me that i'm doing something right and and you know that if i can um you know have a little bit of me rub off on someone else if if that's applicable to them then then that's fantastic for me um obviously throughout the journey we, we've really um as it you know it says here on the screen we've really focused on what we love and what we we believe we're good at um and we've been able to focus even more on that by by having um, Ben come into our team, uh, and recently his wife Sarah has also come into the team, and she um, manages the uh, the accounting software, uh, like the bookwork side of things, and and marketing. Um, you know, we're we're in the process. It's early days, but in the process of setting up a website um, and you know collating data, etc., for the future that that. You know, because we are going to get a, a surplus of rams, as you can see, these are our um, 2019 AI drop ram lambs in in front of us. There, you know, we, we're going to get a surplus. Um, so, if we can market them, um, we're still a few years away from that. But if we can market them, um, then having her in the team will uh, will help also. Uh, so, there's any number of things that we've got through throughout out throughout the program but the, the keys have really been focused on what we are enjoying and what we're good at and 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 hiring well um and then in this slide stems from that um obviously having ben work for us um, has allowed me to spend more time with harriet there she's a little firecracker 16 months now running around and talking and carrying on it's and it's really really nice to be here uh on a above average um you know, timing throughout the week than than what I imagine most farmers are doing with their young families. Um, to see her develop, and you know, and future kids. Uh, you know, obviously, there's nothing yet, but your future kids. You know, I want to be able to, you know, copy that process as well. And 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 we mentioned, you know, Kate's from the UK, and and both of us have travelled a lot in our younger years. Um, you know the the top picture on the right there with the the you know dog sledding that was our honeymoon in the Arctic Circle in uh, that was proper cold mind you um, up in uh, northern Sweden uh, Sweden um, you know obviously there's Harriet at visiting the Queen um, in London and you know those, those things are they're top of the list for us like obviously yes I love my job and I love my business but but this is what's most important to me and um, you know, so so we're going to make sure that that's a priority for us. It's so interesting, Cam. I remember growing up, and and the mantra was two weeks holiday a year over summer, and yeah, from that we just worked. It just I just looking at that photo of Harriet. I just think about her view as a young person growing up on your farm. Her outlook on what um, family and life is actually about is just going to be so different from that that we had where it was two weeks at the beach you know in january yep uh, we we coined that phrase about creating freedom farms so profitable systemized well-resourced businesses that are set up so they can work without you where are you at 
on your journey of, of being a freedom farmer and having a farm that can thrive and profit whether you're there or not? How far do you feel that you're away from achieving that? Yeah, uh, I still think we're a long way away from, you know, if, if I were to say to Ben and Bruce that I was moving to the UK for a year, they'd be like, well, hang on a second. But to be honest, they, they'd, they'd handle it. It, 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 just, it just, we, we need to systemize things a little bit better, make sure that all the documents are, that you know, are drawn up and, um, you know, so that when it comes to landmarking, for example, that you pull out that folder and, and it tells you everything you need to go and get from the, your local merchandise and, you know, just the whole process, um, you know, ringing the contractor or who, you know, just, just talks about everything. So there's any number of those things that, that we still need to do, um, you know, but we are, we are, well, I still think we're a fair way down the track. I'm probably, probably undershooting how far we actually are down that track because I know that, you know, well, I've done it at la this time. Last year we spent six weeks, uh, no, it's five weeks, sorry. It says down the bottom there in 2019, five weeks in the UK. And, yeah, I touched base a little bit with, with Ben, um, you know, and that's a busy, busyish time. Um, you know, we, we were sort of lambing then and, uh, he was catching and tagging all the lambs in the stud and doing all very important sort of stuff. But, but I had not a worry in the world. Like I'm sitting on the other side of the world at, at Lords watching the ashes and, and, you know, having a fantastic time and knew that back home here that my team were, um, you know, continuing the journey that, that, that our business is trying to achieve. I think it's such a mindset shift. Um, to move from being the technical operator of a farm and having to be there working with and managing your team to what you've just described, which is actually empowering your team and supporting them with really strong systems so that they can do even the really important tasks, whether you're there or not. It, it, has that been a real mindset shift for you as part of your journey? Yeah, definitely. But I, I did have a bit of that in me already prior to prior to the journey i mean uh, obviously i'd known kate before the um before i joined farmers academy so i'd thrown bruce the the you know the retired school teacher in the deep end a few times and um but i, I learned from that that, that that my systems need to be a bit better like there was a, a few um flaws that or, or uh, uh say let's say problems that uh arose while, while i was away that uh, that stem back to me not having the 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 steps in place um to a to a high enough level uh, so that that was a, a bit of a wake up call um but oh uh, yeah through the you know like there there definitely has been a mindset shift and particularly that that real monkey was off your back once i had this once i had ben in the team that that uh you know he doesn't need me there most of the time because he just understands he's just he just knows what happens day to day you know and if he if he can't find something to do or sorry if he doesn't necessarily have a uh, um you know a job as such that he needs to do he'll go and find one that needs to be done anyway so we're, we're very very fortunate to have him and yeah it's just made a massive difference to what we've been achieving great businesses attract great people I think it sounds to me like you've achieved that. So well done. Yeah, I mean, I think I, when I'd said that to Tracy once, how lucky, I think I used the word lucky, and she said, you, you create your own luck. So um, this, this is our business coach. And, and yeah, again, she's she's got a big part to play in, in where we're at today. Thank you, mate. It's just wonderful to explore your story um, and to have the opportunity, as you say, to share that um, through this podcast. Um, just for those listening, um, there's no doubt that Cam and Katie and Lyndall Park is just one of our um, most impressive members. They've just been so dedicated to um, the benchmarking, the financial training, the strategic planning, um, the mindset adjustment, um, courageous around recruiting and around implementing some of the principles that we share at Farm Owners Academy. And um, yeah, so just, just credit to you, Cam, for the way in which you've played the last three years. It's, um, it's been fantastic to, to watch. Yeah, well, thank you. And I mean, uh, as I said, the journey's only really just begun. Like we were obviously 
we're uh, post COVID nineteen. We will graduate from the program, but we'll also uh, we're we're one hundred percent committed to com- continue on in the, the alumni program that you offer. And uh, you know, if we can say, well, obviously, every event you come to, you pick up new things, and it re- reinvigorates you to go home with a with a new lease on life. But also, um, and, and obviously, we're always going to be learning, and there's so much more that we can can do but also you know meet meet other like-minded businesses as, as you recruit more people in and um you learn you learn a lot from all the people in the room not just you guys so yeah we, we're we're in the program all the way thanks cam and you're right it is it's an amazing community i feel very privileged to be part of it so ladies and gents just on this um for me i feel like the best place to get started if if what you've heard is of interest to you and you'd like to know more the farm financial framework program is a fantastic place to start with farm owners academy from july 1 we are running that program live and online it's a five um, module 14 week program that you can do at home and it is all about getting the financial literacy training that you need to go from winging it, as Cam mentioned, to being completely in control of the numbers and the key metrics that are going to help you move your business forward and really take control of the the financial underpinning of your farm business. Um, You will be benchmarked in that and there will be debriefs around your benchmarks such that you can... um, arrive to the end of it knowing exactly what you need to do to significantly improve the underlying profitability and performance of your business. Cam, the financial literacy training, Farm Financial Framework, what would you say about it? Yeah, obviously, it's uh, again, it's an area that I've still got a lot of work to do in, but, but uh, yeah, it's really, it really helped in, in our understanding of uh, how our business is, is performing. Um, uh, you know, away from the operational side of it to, uh, you know, so that we can have a better understanding of, of you know, our cost structure and, and you know, profitability, all these things that we, and, and then areas out of that that we can be making adjustments to make it look even better again. Thanks, Cam. So we value that program at $3,500 and um, we're offering this live training over the next 14 weeks from July 1 for $1,000. Um, it's limited to 150 farming families and we have uh, over 100 committed already. So if that does interest you, please jump on to www.farmownersacademy.com forward slash farm financial framework. So www.farmownersacademy.com forward slash farm financial framework and all the details are there. Cam, um, really appreciate your time and um, it is just wonderful to share your story from the really incredible um, succession that, that you've been part of right through the results that you have achieved and now where you and Katie and Harriet and your growing family are off too. So thank you so much for your time. No worries, mate. Absolute pleasure. Two questions to finish, mate. I'm going to ask all yep. interviewees these questions. Um, what advice, what's the best advice that, that a mentor um, or someone in your life has given you? Oh, uh, that's a really tough question. Um, oh, I, just, I just think out of, out of what we're achieving to just really focus on what you enjoy. Cause you know, if you, I mean, I've always sort of thought that I'm, I'm not really going to work because I enjoy what I'm doing. Um, focus on, on what you're best at and what you enjoy doing and, and, and really do it well. And it, it's not really work. It's not a chore. It's, it's, um, it's, I enjoy the journey and, and it just so happens that it provides a fa- fantastic financial benefit for our family. So what more could you want really? Thank you, mate. And last question, what would you say to a younger you? I'd do it a lot earlier. Uh, what am I? I'll be 38 in November, so I still consider myself young. I like to think I am sometimes when I have a few too many drinks. I don't <laughs> feel like that. But um, I watched, you know, I was only thinking about this the other day. I watched Greg Johnson talk in, 
a local town and and talk about the story that of what he him and and John John and Joe Simons at Turkey Lane on Kangaroo Island had achieved and uh, I watched and listened but I didn't go home and implement and and I I really don't like the fact that I didn't do it because that's probably 10 years ago now so we could have started this process you know a lot sooner and and be achieving you know, where, where we want to be in another 10 years, we'd already be achieving that. And so uh, I'd say make the phone call now. If you, you know, if you, if you like what you hear and see on, on Farm Owners Academy, I'd, I'd ring Andrew Roberts, ring Greg Johnson or ring Jeremy and, and, you know, touch base and, and just do it. You know, it's, it's life changing. Thanks, Cam. I really appreciate that. Um, that endorsement and um, it's fantastic coming from a business like yours that has come from such a strong base and now has such a bright future under your leadership. So mate, thank you so much for your time. All the best to Katie and to Harriet and um, look forward to catching up with you um, as soon as we can uh, get across borders and yeah. enjoy some time together. Yeah, no, nah, looking forward to it when that day may come. Thank you, Cam. No worries. Thanks, mate.